So explain who John Jocks is for those that don't know. Okay, so John Jock Machado, to me, is the GOAT. Like, he's, he's the best that ever did it. He's an amazing man. I've got a couple of stories I could tell you about him that are just insane. Um, the way that he pays attention and his intuition is second to none. Um, I'm just a guy to him, you know. But So, John Jock is um, part of the Machado family. John Jock's aunt, I believe, was the last wife of Carlos Gracie Sr. So, he was born in, in Brazil came up, you ask him, John Jocks, when did you start doing jujitsu? And he's all, boy, man, there was no start. I was born and there was just jujitsu. It was like, he has like no, he has no recollection of a time in his life without jujitsu. And he's, he's in, God, I would hate to even guess, but he's got to be 50, yeah. but, but he looks really good and he's still highly effective and he's in great shape. But, um, he was, he was, uh, the best ADCC competitor in the beginning because Abu Dhabi uh, Combat Club was no gi. And so, like, all the Brazilians that were trying to transition in had to deal with the fact that they had to take the gi off in order to train. And since John Jock doesn't, he's not grip reliant, he had to think outside of the box in jiu-jitsu. Like, how can I be effective if I can't really be grip reliant with both hands? So he used overhooks and underhooks. And then they competed in a lot of different forms of martial arts growing up. But in that culture of having a perceived disability because I wouldn't necessarily call it a disability because he's amazing. He had to kind of let go of tradition and kind of break path with that and then uh, adapt. And in jujitsu, especially old school jujitsu, there's honor tradition. Elio Gracie taught it this way. This is the way that we do it now. And we all know science evolves. I mean, hell, offensive linemen back in the 50s were like 200 pounds. Yeah. You know, they were like 360. Yeah, they were like normal (laughs) sized humans, right? Basketball players, a 6'3 or a 6 foot guard would be considered like a nice size guard back in the day. Now you got to be 6'6. I mean, so we know that things just evolve and hanging on to tradition too tight oftentimes will leave you behind at the end. And I think John Jock was ahead of the curve. So you got a guy like Eddie Bravo who only thinks outside of the box. Like, this dude cannot be confined to a specific way of thinking. He's always going to challenge. And, and having an instructor, so like the instructor I came up with was exactly the opposite. It was like, nope, there's only one way to do this. Well, hey, I've been hitting this a lot just like this. Well, you're doing it wrong, and you're hitting it on guys that suck. As soon as you do it against a good guy, it's not going to work. And, I mean, he was so rigid, and it was just, it was gross. Right, it was just rigid. And my basics are good because of it. Like, I'm not going to lie. But it was just like there was no room to breathe. There was no room to grow. It was like training in a room with just darkness. Yeah. And it's then, like the military. It's like, this is how you would do a push-up. This is how you will shine your boots. This is how you will make your bed. And you're like, but there might be a better way. No, fuck you. This is how we shine our boots for the last 200 years. That's the way you will do it. Exactly. That's exactly how it was. And and so here, here's this guy, Eddie Bravo, who is incapable of being in this rigid environment and he just happens to stumble upon John Jock and maybe he could have gone to a different Gracie family where they were rigid and he wouldn't have made it. And you ask John Jock, like, Hey, what do you think about this? He'll be like, Oh, it looks pretty good. Like, how does it feel? Like, Oh man, it feels good. I'm doing great. And he's like, good. Then it's working. It's good. You know? And so he really encouraged uh, Eddie Bravo to think outside of the box. And, and John Jock was the best no gi grappler back in the day. And so that thinking kind of like helped Eddie evolve into this overhook, underhook player who Eddie was a high school wrestler. A lot of people don't know that. So like leg riding and and twisters is like a really big thing. And so uh, having John Jock like, yeah, heck yeah, hit the twister. That's super cool. Like grab your leg from the bottom and guard. Like this was pre-rubber guard. Like no one really knew what it was. And... um, and then so Eddie started seeing his idols in jiu-jitsu just getting smashed because Eddie came up in the gi. This was all gi back then. Yeah, and, and for context, the gi, you know, the big judo robe, you know, what people are probably picturing of a kimono. For John Jocks to be amazing with that thing on where you depend so much on grips, it would be like taking LeBron James, cutting off his four fingers that he guides every jump shot with, and then he still is the greatest of all time. Like, I mean, that's the equivalent because so much of the gi is grips and holding on to people. And then John Jocks is just like, oh, th- there's not a hand there. I mean, it's fucking crazy. Yeah, he how can good grab he with like his thumb. He's got a little thumb. Yeah, like yeah. he can grab with it. 
But that's why he re- relied on overhooks. And that's how, like, the rubber guard came up. Like, you overhook, you shoot that rubber guard up. And and um, so Eddie Bravo simultaneously was UFC was kicking off. And then Eddie Bravo saw all his idols getting beat up by Mark Coleman, Mark Kerr, like the smashing machine, all these guys just getting inside a closed guard and just smacking jujitsu guys around. And um, Eddie Bravo was like, damn, there's got to be a way. And the rubber guard is to create the grips. That's, that's really what it is. It's like you throw the leg up, you grab your own leg, and you're creating a grip when there's no gi. And so that's kind of how that's, that's kind of how, no gi started and then and then 